Uh, next, I'd like to introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Or Dr. Uh, Mr. Art Hershey. Um, he's an undergraduate, studies at Cornell University with a graduate uh, degree at UCLA. Uh, he's the director of industrial relations for Cutter Laboratories for more than 10 years, as well as being the director of human resources for Los Angeles Turf Club at Santa Anita Park for nearly 15 years, a place that's on my personal bucket list. Over 35 years in senior level management, and human resources and community relations led him at some point to play a central role in the preparation and conduct uh, of the successful 1984 LA Olympics, um, which were really a, a spectacular thing to watch. It's the first Olympics I remember. So without further ado, I'd like to have Art Hershey come up and tell us about LA 84. <laughs> Hi, everybody. God, that was impressive. Well, now that you've heard the best, I'm going home. I can't top that. It's great to be here today at my Asian stage. It's great to be anywhere, frankly. Love that. Uh, Steve McCarthy was very sweet and nice to save me a lot of money shipping out my torch out here. He brought one. And if you've never seen it, this is the torch from the 84 games. It's a beauty. There's no fuel in here, I presume, Steve, is that right? You've emptied it, good. Uh, at, the top, at the top is an engraving of the Colosseum. Uh, Sidious, Altius, Fortius, higher, faster, stronger. Come up and see that later. There's some quotes that I want to mention to you at the end of the talk that I think symbolize so much of the spirit of the Olympic Games. In 1984, there were hard times because we had just finished four years earlier abstaining from the Games in Moscow. Russia got even by abstaining from their, with their presence from Los Angeles. In spite of the political problems, 140 nations showed up, 21 sports, 7,000 athletes, and over 35,000 volunteers. Large number of those volunteers, the whole number for the equestrian events, some 3,000, were my responsibility. The Olympics utilized 31 venues. Of those venues, two were there in 1932 when the Olympics were held also in Los Angeles. The Rose Bowl and the Coliseum were the two sites. Two new sites were created. The uh, endurance test at Rancho Santa Fe in Del Mar, south of us, for the uh, equestrian three-day event. And the tennis center was new. The other 27 venues were all there, just like the Rose Bowl and the Coliseum. One of the big reasons why we made money, we the Olympic Committee. There were two demonstration sports, baseball and tennis, for the first time. Let me get to the preparation, and I'm going to talk primarily, almost entirely, about the equestrian events. I had enough to keep me up at night for a year before the Games, in addition to doing my full-time job I had a full-time job recruiting 3,000 volunteers. 
I didn't do it all. I had a huge team for that. Santa Anita Park, if you've never been, how many of you have been to Santa Anita Park, the racetrack? Oh, quite a few of you have, okay. It has three concentric racing circles and a grandstand that's one quarter of a mile long, 1,500 feet. That's the length of five football fields. Portion of that was used for seating, of course, but that's only 25% of the stadium. So we had to build the other three sides of the stadium to eventually build a 35,000 seat stadium on all four sides. <clears throat> the arena itself surrounding that stadium uh, was, or was surrounded by the stadium, was 60 feet wide and 200 feet long. In order to create that, because the stadium really, the, the floor of the, of the arena uh, was all dirt, we brought in 20,000 tons of dirt to fill in the area of 60 by 200. It was a massive, massive project to get this thing done. We had the site, but the site had to be altered materially to change from a racetrack to a stadium of 35,000 people. In addition to this, we had extraordinary dietary problems. You don't think about this because you're not part of the Olympics, save the one lady. Who was the lady back there who was in track? You're here to keep me legitimate, right? Bless you, thank you, and congratulations for your participation. My thrill for the Olympics, other than just being a part of it and, and whatever, was meeting people like Greg Luganis and a few others who are such wonderful participants, wonderful athletes. They're a breed apart, but I'll come to that later. One of the things we needed to do was feed the athletes, several hundred competing riders. They came from 30 different countries. Their meals were as varied as any array of restaurants you'll find here in Boulder. It was unbelievable. And if you're a Muslim from a Muslim country, you will not eat certain meats. If you're here from Israel, you will not have pork when pork is being served to everybody else, and so forth, right down the line. You know what I'm talking about. Somehow we came to a conclusion that it was good to simply have as many bland foods as possible so anybody could eat almost anything. <laughs> By the way, I meant to mention at the outset, uh, are you aware of why the track and field team, young lady, you're part of it, does not keep, uh, uh, are you aware of where you kept, keep your Olympic medals? You, you know where they keep them, don't you? In a pole vault. <laughs> oh yeah. Why is, Sun tanning, not an Olympic sport. Anybody know that? Because the best you can ever get is bronze. I'll quit while I'm behind. I do want to come back with some quotes later from great Olympians, which I think are significant. One of the biggest jobs I had, as I mentioned earlier, was recruiting over 2,000, between two and 3,000 volunteers. Big job. Put an ad in the newspapers, word of mouth went out around the equestrian community. And it took better part of a year to come up with the numbers that we needed to have. We had over 50 job classifications to fill for volunteers. We had a number of jobs that were paid. That's a whole different story entirely. People came from all over the country for this. It turned out like unbelievable numbers. What fascinated me was I'm sitting in the entrance to a hotel love, a conference room where we were conducting the interviews for hundreds of people that it turned out. This absolutely magnificent woman comes over to me, magnificent in the sense she's very tall, very slender, very beautiful.
dressed like no one you've ever seen before dressed. Unbelievably beautiful clothing. She came up to me with this beautiful radiant smile and said, I'm here, please, to be a volunteer. I said, you're from England. She said, how did you know? I said, somehow it must be the look you have. And she said, yes, I am. I go to these events all the time. Her name was Monica Hunt. Her husband, which will mean nothing to you, and nothing about her husband will mean anything, except he was the pedi pediatrician to the queen. And when she told me that, I made a first faux pas. I said, what the hell does the queen need with a pediatrician at her age? <laughs> but it was not for her. It was for the children, of course. She was a magnificent woman, and she traveled the world and knew everybody in the equestrian field because it was part of her life. She came from Austria originally, knew so many people. Marty, do you remember ever meeting her? She spoke five, five languages, so one of the things I said right away, you're going to be my, one of my interpreters. I needed about half a dozen interpreters in different languages. She was the first one we brought on board. Very, very sweet lady. I eventually spent time with her at her home with her husband the following year. Made a fatal mistake of leaving my wallet in the bedroom. Why well, was a fatal mistake? Because the bedroom was up on the fourth floor and they had no elevators. It was a hell of a walk to go get my wallet to bring back down. Another beautiful moment was sitting in my office about two weeks before the games. We had filled just about all the jobs, a couple of jobs we hadn't filled yet. One was, of all things, the ushers for the grandstand. A lady came in, 80-some years old, looked like she was 80-some years old, gray hair, very short, very slender. And she said, I want to be a volunteer. I said, the only thing we have left is being an usher in the grandstand, and I'm not sure at your age and stage in life, this is something you probably ought to be doing. And she said, why? I said, because it's very, very, very hot and very humid potentially in Los Angeles in the first two weeks of August. She said, why don't you let me look at the stadium? I said, yes, I'll be glad to. I took her out. We stood at the bus, bottom of the stairs and she ran up the stairs, ran down the stairs, thank God holding onto the rail, turned around, ran back up the stairs again, and ran down the stairs again. And without a huff or puff, which would have drowned me out completely had I done it, at my age then, 30 years ago, she said, is that enough proof? <laughs> I said, baby, you're hired. She, of all things, was a retired professor uh, from uh, Caltech, right next door in, in, uh, in Pasadena. And uh, she was a, a wonderful lady who I maintained a relationship with for many years thereafter. Just absolute sweetheart of a lady. Uh, in the process of getting ready for the games, we put on horse shows every summer for two years before, three, three years before the, the games themselves. And we would have crowds out. We had big fundraising dinners for the US equestrian team. And one of the participants uh, in riding in the games and a big supporter, too, was Zsa, Zsa Gabor. She's quite an equestrian. If you looked at her in those days, you'd say, God, she's not really built to be an equestrian. She was a little bit on the softic side, uh, all, with all due respect. She's a beautiful woman. And uh, she shows up with her entourage of 42 people. And she tried to come in, not through the turnstile, but through a separate gate. Well, guarding the gate was a fellow by the name of Ray Ellis, which would mean nothing to you because Ray was a former police chief in Temple City, California. And uh, he retired and was helping us just after hours thing for him with not only the Olympics, but with our regular racing program during the course of the year. A great guy, really great guy, but tough as nails, as you would imagine a determined old codger would be who was retired from being in, in law enforcement. So he's manning the gate, or peopling the gate, I guess is a better way to say it in this day and age. And lo and behold, she and her entourage show up at the gate, not going through the turnstile, but wanted to come through Ray Ellis's place. 
And uh, she comes in, Ray says, over there, please. You have to go through the turnstile. One of her lead security people said to Ray, you have no idea who she is. That is Zsa, Zsa Gabor. And Ray looked at him, equal consternation in his voice, and says, I don't give a damn. If she's Zazu Pitts, she's using the turnstile like everybody else. And she did, finally. She never spoke to me for two years after that. Anyway, the conduct of the games went flawlessly. It was good preparation. Uh, there's a spirit that pervades the games that I never began to get in touch with until I was part of it. I was never an athlete myself, played a lot of sports like we all did growing up, but never involved in the games at all until then. I was quite moved, incredibly moved, with the spirit, the feeling, the power that reigns over every athlete, every coach, every person who supports the team, and there are dozens of people who support each team that comes out there. I was amazed at how many there are. I was amazed at the kind of crowd we attracted. 35,000 people every day in the middle of a hot summer. Unbelievable, who sat there constantly just enjoying and watching and thrilling with every turn of the horse and every jump of the rider. There were nine days of competition, six at Santa Anita, three down at Rancho Santa Fe. Uh, I'm going to, by the way, provide you with, two of you anyway, with a reproduction of an ABC Sports summary, a DVD made by ABC, uh, it's 90 minutes long, of all of the Olympics that were held that year, along with 60 minutes of their same coverage of the equestrian events and 10 minutes of something we developed as a special uh, affair that we, we did just for the equestrian sport itself. And I'm going to give that DVD to two people, along with a very brief CD of clips from the opening and closing ceremonies from the 1932 games in Los Angeles. Very special. We had over 50,000 people, by the way, on a brand new golf course down in Del Mar. You may have heard the name Watt, W-A-T-T, Watt Industries. Big, big company in, Los, in, uh, in California, I should say, not Los Angeles. Uh, and they built a golf course and a housing development overlooking the valley of Del Mar. Beautiful, beautiful place. And the first day of the event, never, a golfer had never hit a ball but the first ball that was ever hit was four hooves galloping all over the place. It was a beautiful thing to watch. The crowd demeanor was incredibly respectful, incredibly beautiful. Uh, I, I can't tell you how moved we all were by just the movement of what did and what did not happen. There were no, no problems, there were no issues that arose. Even the freeways were wide open. And the freeways down there, you know, for that to happen in Los Angeles is some kind of earthquake would cause it. But it happened because everybody was so frightened of the traffic, everybody left town ahead of time, leaving nobody in town for the games, which was great. Literally, you could drive the freeway any time of the day or night. I won't say there were no cars on the freeway. There were, of course, but so few. It was unbelievable. People were saying, <laughs> to hell with rapid transit. Let's not pay for that. Let's get the games back here solve all our problems. Occasionally we'd have a few issues of people trying to get into what we call the private turf club at the track. This was a private membership club. And only the very best of the best came in there. Best of the best to find is very high income people who were very special. And uh, they tried to come in, many people tried to come in knowing that there were a lot of dignitaries there, heads of state. His Royal Highness, the F Prince Philip, was head of the Equestrian Federation, and he was there with an entourage of people. Everybody wanted to see him, and for good reason. He was a magnificent human being, by the way. Unbelievable. I'll never forget one night before the games actually began, he was there 
and he was coming in from the tunnel under the grandstand into the operations office. It's about midnight. And I am now leaving. I had put in about an 18-hour day like I usually did in those days. And I'm going out a door that had a glass panel into the door that had a frosting on it. And there were lights out in the tunnel. So I could see out images. I could see forms through the door. As you looked into the office where I was, it was pitch black. I'm reaching for the door just as he coming in from the tunnel is reaching for the door. I bring the door open and in he comes lunging at me because he missed the doorknob. It was no longer there when I opened the door. It didn't take more than two seconds for four very burly security men to be all over me. And what the hell is going on? They said, who are you? What are you doing here? I didn't have this. This is a credential badge, by the way. By the way, we've set up a table in the back. If you turn around, you'll see some great pictures uh, on, on, on the little stands there. Uh, Marty Evans was very sweet and very nice uh, to bring in a lot of her things, which saved me the trouble of bringing so much out, and some things that I brought, which will give you an indication of some of the memorabilia that still lives on in our minds, uh, including tickets from the 1932 games, by the way some artificial, some real, that they were taken of the, of the real tickets. And uh, it was, it was it's just something that you, you just can't get your hand around until you live it. It's very special. It's very special. I, I can't put it into words. Can't begin to put it into words. Prince Philip, by the way, was not only a marvelous guy, but he was a great host. Many of the stories you have heard about him are very true. He loved to party. And every time, and we had nothing but parties all the time when the games were on, not just the equestrian events. I think all the sports had them, except track and field, of course, who went to bed early every night because they had, <laughs> right, right. I, I see you shaking your head, I believe it. That was your problem, lady. Times have changed. I've heard stories about you more recently. You've made up for lost time, haven't you? Um, but he loved to party, to dance. Did he do anything else? I don't think so. But he was a great party boy and loved to do it. And the women loved him for good reason. He's a handsome man to begin with. Very enjoyable, good conversationalist. Didn't do a lot of drinking, he just partied. He knew how to do it and knew it well from the very top. Let me tell you that by the time everything was said and done after two weeks of competition, the U.S. had won five gold medals in equestrian events. Five of them, which is very unusual for us to have done. We took three sil silver, and uh, it was just an incredibly wonderful feeling. Overall, we had won 30, uh, 83 gold medals in 1984. 83 gold medals, that's quite an accomplishment. 61 silver and 30 bronze. What was even better for us as part of the Olympic Organizing Committee, as we were known at the time, is the fact we made $225 million. That money to this day is still paying for, to this day, that was 37 years ago, if my math is correct, 38 years ago. That money today is still buying the opportunity for young children, black, white, Hispanic, whomever, wherever, however, to participate in sports, to participate in growing up with a feeling that they too can be Olympians. Unbelievable, $225 million. Before that, Moscow lost its shirt. Before that, Montreal lost its shirt in 76. The conduct was flawless overall, and the games are coming back to LA in 2028. I'm not sure I'm going to become a part of it at that point. I'm getting a little too old to cut the mustard, and I'd really watch it on prefer watching it on TV or spending a couple of hundred bucks for a ticket like I did. Even then, by the way, at my own facility, I had to spend, not for me, but for guests who I brought in to watch the games, the jumping stadium, jumping and dressage, $200. One of those tickets is there at $200. Happens to be not from Santa Anita, but from the closing events at the Coliseum. That's a lot of money 38 years ago. 
On my wall, I have a lot of things in my life that I'm very proud of. One section of the wall is devoted to the Olympics. And in it, or on it, is a very beautiful motto from the Olympics, which says, the important thing in the Olympics is not to win, but to take part. Not to win, but take part. Let me tell you what some Olympic athletes have said about that. Jesse Owens, you know the name. If you don't try to win, you might as well hold the Olympics in somebody's backyard. Even in 1936, he was out to win. Mia Hamm, you know the name if you're a soccer enthusiast from the US team. I'm building a fire every day. Every day that I train, I add more fuel. At just the right time, I light the match. Cohn Verweg, speed skater and silver medalist. I'm not satisfied. The silver medalist is the first loser. The silver medalist is the first loser. That's a powerful statement. And last, Mark Spitz, nine-time gold medalist said, if you fail to achieve, I'm sorry, if you fail to prepare, you're prepared to fail. Great lines from great people. So if you think that this Olympic competition is just to participate, you're wrong. Everybody is wrong because the people who participate, young lady, am I correct? You're in it to win. True. It's wonderful to be in it, and it's wonderful to participate, and it's wonderful, even if you lose, to feel as though you gave your very best. But everybody who goes in wants more than just participation trophy. They want to win. That's what I took away from the games. It causes me to get very emotional, as I am now. Forty years later almost, still thinking about it because nothing is bigger or better, very little at any rate is bigger or better. Maybe the Super Bowl in football, maybe the World Series in baseball, but when it comes to worldwide competition, nothing beats the Olympics. It's very special. Thank you for letting me spare these, share these very special times with you today. If you have any questions, I think we still have a couple of minutes and be glad to take some. Oh, by the way, uh, Marty, what is your birthday? December 14. Well, no, I don't care about him. I just want you. He's not a member. Whose birthday is closest to December 14? I don't want to know how old you are, not the year, just the date. What do you have? December 3rd. Anybody closer than that? Well, guess what? You have the first of two DVDs on the Olympics from 84 and a CD from 32 games, okay? I'll let you come up later and get it. Uh, Dale, uh, Mr. President, what was your birthday again? July, July 27? July 27. Who's the closest to July 27? August 4. August 4. July 31. Do I hear July 30? Do I hear 27? <laughs> okay, young lady, you get the other one. Anyway, thank you. Be glad to take whatever questions you've got. Any questions? Yeah, I thought your, your, your talk was great. A uh, question would be, since 1984, do you think the spirit of the Olympics has changed, and if so, in what way? You know, it's a hard question to answer in the sense that I haven't been part of the Olympics other than a, 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 a voyeur and watch it just like you do. Uh, from a political point of view, I don't think a lot has changed. Politics always have been a part of the games always will be a part of the games, you can't get away from it. I think the numbers have increased in terms of the number of athletes. 
uh, the dollars are getting bigger and bigger that are put into it each year. I feel so badly for countries like, like Japan, who held great Olympics last year, and nobody was allowed to show up for them. That is not Japan's fault, it's just what happens. But even had people shown up, it would have been a question mark as to how many people would have shown. Uh, it worked out beautifully in, uh, in China, before that in Beijing. Uh, they had great, great opportunity uh, and took full advantage of it to make everybody feel very welcome, and they did, in spite of the smog that they had and a lot of other things. But I don't think the essence of the Olympics have changed. That will never change. It is still as vibrant today as it was 2,000 years ago when they had the original games in Athens, truly. I just wanted to ask if um, Russia's choice not to participate in the games and US's choice not to participate in the games before that had an impact on the experience from an athlete's or an organizer's perspective. The, the athletes in both countries were horribly, horribly upset in the U.S. with President um, Carter for withdrawing the United States from the Games. I'm not sure what the athletes in Russia felt because nobody was willing to ever convey what that was publicly. But privately, you would hear words coming back through other people, third party involvers, uh, that they were terribly upset, and rightfully so. As an Olympic athlete, no matter what sport, whether you're a swimmer or a runner or an equestrian or whatever the heck you are, you are practicing for years, some since you're knee high to a grasshopper if you're a swimmer, and all of a sudden you're not allowed to swim anymore. It's horribly disappointing. I, I felt so badly for them. I felt badly even though the games were not overly impacted in 84. Uh, we had an incredible turnout of participants, incredible turnout of fans, and they saw great games, which you'll see if you ever have an opportunity of looking at this. You can probably get this online if you want to look for it. But it's a beautiful moment, beautiful moment. But yes, it is a terrible thing when politics intervenes. It's a terrible thing when politics intervenes in anything in our lives. Let's face it, we're seeing a lot of that now, unfortunately, and have had for years. It's we against them and whatever, and it, it, it's, it's so destructive. Uh, it was even worse when you get internationally the way it was in 1980 and 84. I feel so badly for them, and always will, as they will always feel badly. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Can you talk a little bit about doping and how that's uh, impacted the spirit of the games? I'm sorry, I talk about what? Doping and performance enhancing drugs. I thought you were being complimentary about me. <laughs> <laughs> doping has always gone on on a very limited basis. They have very, very strict rules in, in Olympic protocols about what you can do and what you cannot do in, in, in any sport. Uh, doping of a horse, doping of the rider, doping of, 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 a, of a track star and so forth. And the testing is done. Um, people will still be devious. People will still, not everybody, I don't mean to imply that. And I don't taint any and all athletes with this. But there are a few who want to make that, it takes sometimes a little bit just a little bit of advantage over another person. And if taking a stimulant, for example, will help me get to the finish line a little bit quicker than the next guy, boy, you know, I'm going to do it. And there are some who will. It's the same people who think they can get away with some kind of uh, what do I want to say? Uh, I, I'm a lot of lost for words for a change. Uh, where you do things against the law, you take the short way to the finish line. You, you think nobody's going to catch you or get caught. Is there a problem in, in the Olympics? Yes. 
but very, very minor in terms of the number of athletes who are actually participating. Those are caught anyway, compared to those in total who are clean. Talk about 98%, 99% are clean. That's a hell of a record. Is that 1% in every occupation, in every avocation, in every piece of life. As beautiful a community as you have here in Boulder, it doesn't get any more beautiful than this. You have your share of deadbeats in this town, don't you? The crime blotter is there. But the point remains that the majority of people are legitimate, and they are good, and they're clean. And that's what counts. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Are there any sports or events that have been added since 1984? Uh, there are sports that have been added. Uh, one that I know of is, um, what is the kind in um, indoor uh, with the, the, the stick and the, the flag and Rhythmic gymnastics, where the, the swirling around, they're doing tumbles and whatever. That's come on board. Um, rock climbing is another one. There are some who come on, and some say they should not be Olympic sports. But they come in, and that's fine. That's what makes for a good, good competition all the way around. Um, we have one last question online from Nancy Chin Wagner. Thank you so much, Art, for your presentation. It was wonderful. My question for you, have you heard of Olympians with their passion, their determination and energy in competitive games have the same spirit of competitiveness in their adult life? Does it continue or they just figure, well, that was when I was younger? You know, that's hard to say because Oftentimes, I and many others don't follow athletes once they move from a youthful competitiveness into middle life, age 40, age 50, and higher. So I don't know what they do in life. I know I talked about Mark Spitz. I don't know if, how many of you have seen Mark Spitz recently in television advertising. Have you seen him lately? Anybody? I just saw him this morning for um, that headache a pill. What is it? Three three week uh, headache pill for 1995 or whatever it is. I say, what's he doing with it? And it dawned on me, he made. <laughs> he hasn't been a swimmer in years. It's a good way to make money. Um, but I just don't know that that when they actually grow older, uh, they learn how to compete. They learn how to compete well, and when they learn how to compete well at age 20 or 30 they're gonna compete well when they're 40 or 50. They're cleaner, they're faster, they're stronger, they're higher. It's what this Olympic torch has. This is a thing of beauty. Higher, faster, stronger. That's their motto, and for good reason. This is the Olympic motto, this is the Olympic symbol. And it's a thing of beauty to behold. And they live this every day of their lives. So even when they are no longer competitive, they still compete. And to answer your question, although I don't know these people personally, I have to believe that you cannot go through the regimen of what it takes to prepare for and compete in the Olympics without doing the same thing in life. Am I correct in that, young lady? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Art, very much. And you've given us a wonderful trip down memory lane. Um, and one of my takeaways is when in life you're given an opportunity to say yes to something that you might not normally have done, such as the opportunity to volunteer and work with you during that time, um, I remember asking you, you know, I've got to work, and you said so. Um, you know, people are taking vacations this year, so that's exactly what I did, and it's one of the most wonderful things. So thank you for that. And also on an international level, the next year, 1985, Rotary International, in collaboration with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, decided to attack 
another problem, or perhaps collaborate in addressing one, that being the eradication of polio. In 1985, there were 123 countries that had polio outbreaks. This year, there are only two, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So as we like to say in Rotary, we are just this close. And in thank you and our gratitude for your presentation today. And I know it was a question of when I can get to Boulder to be with those grandsons and the family. And today was the day, homecoming weekend. Um, we say thank you. And the way that we do so in Boulder Rotary is donating 100 doses of the polio vaccine to the Polio Plus campaign. Nice. So thank you. And thank you for being here so much. I'll close, I'll close with the fact that I'm holding up a tape measure. On the front, it says, guest speaker, Altadena Rotary Club. Altadena is a suburb of Pasadena. I got this 38 years ago. On the back is a four-way test. You've heard of the four-way test. When I have too much to drink, it's a five-way test. <laughs> but I still carry this around. I still use it. And it's a wonderful thing. So I brought it along just to show Marty, who is, by the way, one of my hostesses in the private turf club for the uh, 84 games. She did a beautiful job and so wonderful to have on board. She's so typical of the kind of people that we got. High class, high talent, bright people, beautiful people. And that's what's going on behind the scenes that you don't see as viewers when you turn on the television set. For the two of you who got these, come up and let me give them to you. And again, folks, thank you for allowing me here and be able to talk to you about something I love so dearly.